Dr. Stambaugh, Chair of the Academic Senate. And on behalf of the Academic Senate, I'm happy to welcome everyone to a new academic year. We all know the beginning of this academic year is unlike the beginning of any other academic year, but that just means what we do is that much more important. 22 years ago, with a newly minted PhD and a full head of thick, dark hair, I stepped into the classroom for the first time and I still remember the energy. From that first moment, I knew that this is what I wanted to do because there is still nothing quite like the rush of the first day of class. As educators, we all know that feeling. When we see students make intellectual connections they never made before. When we hear new perspectives from the students that make us realize that we can still learn. And when we see the impact of a Titan education on our students and on our community. This year, most of us will log into the classroom instead of walking into the classroom. The amount of work our faculty, staff, administration, and students have done to make this possible is incredible and worthy of far more than just our thanks and praise. It is also true that this work is not done. This year, perhaps more than any other, we need to show what it is to be Titans, to have engaging, challenging academic experiences with our faculty and our students, to engage in cutting edge research, to help mentor a next generation of students activities through activities, even if they are mostly virtual. Although this is the first year that all of us, including our new colleagues and our new students, will not have the shared bonding experience of finding parking at the beginning of the semester. It is the year when we all come together to tackle some important issues and build what we want Cal State Fullerton to be when all of this is over. Together, we will deal with the challenges like the pandemic and the budget and we will build new programs such as the exciting new ethnic studies requirement. We will continue connecting with our alumni and our community as evidenced by the record amount of financial support our alumni and community partners recently gave because they believe in our mission and they believe in our record of transforming lives. We also look forward to once again safely walking across a vibrant crowded campus. We look forward to the intellectual stimulation of a great class session, and then talking about it while getting coffee at one of the Starbucks or at Aloha Java. We definitely look forward to once again seeing a season of Titan Theater and cheering on Titan athletes on their way to even more conference championships. Until we can all do that together again, we just need to be there for each other and work together on the big challenges and opportunities facing us. We will have a busy year in the Senate this year because of the challenges the challenges in the world, and the recent paradigm shifting call to finally address systemic problems throughout society, including here at home. This year, we also welcome a new partner towards this mission. In fact, she's our new provost and vice president of academic affairs, Dr. Carolyn Thomas. We don't just welcome her, but we welcome her home. Dr. Thomas is proof of the saying, once a Titan, always a Titan, as she returns to her alma mater. It's my honor to introduce her today, and not just because she is a proud alumna of my home college of humanities and social sciences, having earned a degree in American studies in German. It's my honor because even in the few short months we've worked together, I've been impressed by her focus, her commitment to what we do, and her interest in being an active member of the Titan community. Dr. Thomas brings with her a record of success as a faculty member and as vice provost and dean for undergraduate education at UC Davis, and brings with her a fresh eye and perspective to what we can accomplish here at Cal State Fullerton. I know that Provost Thomas would rather be getting to know all of us and refamiliarizing herself with campus in person. That will have to wait. But in the meantime, she has already proven to be an active partner in our long tradition of shared governance and the Fullerton way. On a personal note, she even let me talk her into competing in a fundraising event for campus charities by matching her constitutional knowledge in a game of constitutional jeopardy against Dr. Rob Robinson from Political Science and Vice President of Student Affairs, Tanatsa Nosegura. All this will take place during Constitution Week and I hope people will tune in. Being willing to step up like that so soon after joining campus is a good sign of things to come. With that, let me formally welcome Dr. Thomas to campus and turn this convocation over to her for a few words. Hi, it's wonderful to be back among Titans. And while I wish we could be together on campus, 
I'm finding that the qualities of who we are come across loud and clear to me from a distance. A dedication to students, a belief in communication, collaboration, and open debate, a deep ex expertise in scholarship across the disciplines and the creative arts, and an awareness that this is the moment when we can take tangible steps to create a community that is more inclusive in our attitudes, in our structures, and in our people. I'm grateful for the opportunities that Fullerton opened up to me, and I'm happy to be able to give back by serving as provost, helping you open up opportunities for those who are here now and those who will follow. For this convocation, I want to share with you what I'm privileged to see every day in my work across the campus, a bird's eye view. Thank you to my dean colleagues for helping me compile these vignettes. I hope it helps you see the ways that our parts come together to form something bigger than ourselves, yet totally dependent on each of us, a more healthful, a more just, a more meaningful, and a more sustainable future. The Pollock team at the library has stepped up left and right during this pandemic. They've made print and other physical materials available for circulation. Interlibrary loan has been fully operational. Reference and instruction services are as robust as ever and virtual and the library's general collection has returned to campus. And any day, we'll see lockers installed that will allow contactless pickup and return. You might wanna check out their new reading service, Leganto, or if reading isn't your medium, dive into one of the more than 170 films that they've fully digitized. Thank you to the library faculty and staff for meeting us with knowledge wherever we are. In the College of Arts, students have continued to flourish in recent months working on solo projects and collaborating, as they say, together apart in quarantine, reminding us all of our human resilience. Like those in Professor Fernando de Rosario's graphic design course, who offered free services to businesses hard hit in the pandemic and continue to offer those services even after the course was over. This year in CODA, there's so much to look forward to, like a fall semester with surprises like live streamed concerts, drive-in theater performances, and innovative exhibitions. There's also a forthcoming e-blast we should look for with the perfect title, Articulate, that shows us some of the creative expressions of our students and faculty and inspires us at home. With over 9,000 students and faculty who are consistently outperforming their past years with scholarly publications, the power of ideas, even in our virtual hallways, are alive and well in the College of Business and Economics. This year, we'll see learning continuing to happen inside and out of the classroom, as is a college tradition, with programs like the Executive Residence Program that brings centuries of leadership experience from our business professionals together with our faculty to help our students learn. And let's not forget the Titan Capital Management Program that takes students who are building towards careers in financial services and puts them in practical settings so they can learn about investment. The beneficiaries of that are those of us on campus, especially in student serving programs. The College of Engineering and Computer Science continues to prepare us as a community and as a nation to meet societal challenges through technical and management expertise. Funded by Veterans Affairs, Professor Kieran George and his students are developing a low-cost voice-controlled robotic arm that will help visually impaired veterans undertake essential daily activities like opening doors and manipulating objects, as well as combining those functions to be able to do things like open a refrigerator and take something out, all by vocally instructing the robotic arm. This project will provide important support for our veterans and is just one example of many of ECS faculty and students who are pursuing innovation to change lives for the better. One of the hallmarks of our College of Education is the ability to provide cutting edge training to educators and education leaders with work that makes the community better. For example, in spite of the pandemic's limitations, COE faculty have been supporting the community through free webinars for teachers in online teaching and learning, and they've also been providing learning support for Asian language development and anti-racist teaching. This last summer, they provided virtual summer camps in language development and reading, and this fall, they're providing free tutoring for K through 12 students. For our College of Health and Human Development, there's excitement about this year's experiential learning opportunities. It's good to know that our faculty and students will be out there keeping us safe and healthy with proper PPE 
in opportunities like the School of Nursing students and faculty who will participate in the pandemic intervention as members of our COVID response team, social work students who are completing field instruction courses in medical and community settings, and in addition, HHD is enhancing diversity, equity, and inclusion through things like reviewing the curriculum to look for places and make sure that the curriculum is culturally relevant and reviewing department personnel standards to see that we're adequately rewarding this important work. Their college lunch and learn series this year, the theme will be critical conversations in health equity and justice. It's hard to imagine a time when we needed the College of Humanities and Social Sciences more because whether it's through statistical or textual analysis, whether it's systemic, systematic observation and experimentation, storytelling, story collecting, poetry reading and poetry writing, those methods all combine in the quest to develop more complete understanding of what it means to be human, what it means to be connected, what it means to facilitate change. Here's just two examples of faculty work emerging this year, framed by the lenses of their discipline, both on incarceration and showing us a path that can create change. Natalie Graham's Visiting Hours in the Shadows is a collection of poems and photographs that dramatizes and honors the lives of Black women from San Bernardino, Orange, and LA counties who have immediate family members or intimate partners who are incarcerated. The collection centers on the lives lived alongside Black men who are often imagined to be the main characters in narratives of mass incarceration. The centerpiece is a, of the collection is a family with four generations of women in San Bernardino County who each have intimate partners or immediate family members who are incarcerated. Latasha Trailer's project explores the temporal aspects of resource acquisition and decision-making strategies by formerly incarcerated women during their post-incarceration reintegration. This work will contribute to evidence-based approaches that foster a better life for these women and their families, as well as improve the life in communities affected by incarceration. We're fortunate to have a College of Communication with a long-standing commitment to advancing democratic society, as well as supporting the First Amendment rights that undergird a healthy democracy. Last year, students from across the college's four departments won so many awards for film editing, breaking news, sports news, student media advertising, leadership and ethics and speech debate, speech language pathology, print and digital magazine writing, and interactive multimedia. A special pride, the bilingual broadcast news program, Aldea, won a student Emmy for news coverage of the migrant crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. On the faculty side, Dr. Irene Matz won the Academic Senate's 2020 Award for Faculty Leadership and Collegial Governance. The college year will be especially focused for faculty, students, and staff, given the upcoming election in November and the delivery of census population counts in December. We're grateful to have them at this critical time working to advance democracy in the community and the nation. A college that loves numbers is our College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. And fortunately, they can take on very large numbers, which are at the heart of many of today's most interesting science and math problems, things that affect everyday um, experiences like search engines, traffic patterns, and of course, climate and public health. Via their Center for Computational and Applied Mathematics, two faculty, Sam Bassetta and Deirdre Bashara, are using that center to build a model to predict the spread of COVID-19 using infection rate over time from the two most populous counties in all 50 states. They're investigating what happens when an asymptomatic person moves from community one to community two. And what happens if people don't wear masks or do wash hands and practice social distancing? Do those things. Models such as theirs are universal and because of that, they can help decision makers make informed policy choices. Thank you to the faculty and the staff across academic affairs and across campus for all you are doing to make our eventual homecoming something we can all look forward to. With this level of engagement and ideas and commitment to making the world a better place, it's astounding to think through what we'll be able to do when we actually take all of this knowledge, this commitment, and this human power and bring it back together. I know that I already feel like I'm home and for that, I'm grateful to so many of you for building this tremendous community. I can't wait to see what the year brings. Go Titans. Hello Titans.
My name is Marcus Savellas, pronouns he, him, his, and I'm your ASI president for 2020-2021. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Osagira, our new vice president for student affairs. Before we begin, I just wanna say it's been a privilege to work with VP Osagira thus far. I know that her servant leadership stems from a lifelong passion for equitable and student-centered higher education, and she has tremendous passion for the pride of Cal State Fullerton. If you have yet to meet VP Osegir, I want to tell you a little bit about her because it's important to know your leaders. First off, VP Osegir has a student's first approach that is energizing and inspiring. From what I've learned and seen, her poise, intellect, decision-making ability, strength, and of course her contagious smile have made her a beloved figure within the Titan community. More importantly though, her expertise in and passion for the retention care and persistence for all students with great focus on underserved populations have directly led to an increase of student success. Originally joining CSUF as a Dean of Students over seven years ago, it was here that VP Osegira first began to lead endeavors that helped our university take steps forward to becoming an even more inclusive and transformational environment. Most recently, an Associate Vice President for Student Affairs, VP Osegira either led or partnered with across campus to create a one-stop shop for students' needs and concerns. Check out on Fullerton.edu's homepage. Develop Tuffy's Basic Needs Resource Center, the first basic needs resource center in the California State University system, and form the Titan Dreamers Resource Center, one of the first resource centers dedicated to undocumented students in the nation. A first-generation college student born and raised in Mexico City, VP Osegira earned a doctoral degree in higher education administration from USC, a master's in higher education and student affairs administration from the University of Vermont, and a bachelor's degree in human development and family studies with an emphasis in gerontology and women's studies. Please welcome VP Osegira. Dear colleagues, I am Dr. Tonancino Seguera your newly minted Vice President of Student Affairs. This opportunity is humbling and invigorating. I seek to bring something fresh and vital to the role of Vice President and to our partnership with Academic Affairs. My center of gravity in student affairs is service. Service to our students, to our colleagues, the President, and to the university to realize everyone's best ideas for graduation, success, and harmony within the university to bring confidence whenever possible and wherever conflict resides. This academic year is unique and replete with opportunities for deepening our service to students and to one another. Thank you for this opportunity to be at faculty convocation and to stand before you and present the student affairs accomplishment for this past year and vision for the coming year. This past year, we achieved much in spite of the COVID pandemic. We raised $6 million in philanthropic funds to support scholarships and emergency grants, most of which went to DACA and international students when the CARES Act left them out of financial support. Our cohort of Tuffy's graduation scholars had a retention rate of 98% and their GPA was higher than the all student average. We also launched our inaugural cohort of I Am First Career Readiness Program for first generation students. Our Center for Educational Partnerships was selected as one of the national examples by Excelencia in Educación. Our financial aid launched its submission verification platform online, first of its kind in the system, and awarded $20 million in CARES Act funds in May. They have been working tirelessly to ensure that all students have adjusted aid for fall. We launched our You at Fullerton mental health and wellness app for students and we pivoted from an in-person orientation to a virtual orientation where 8,000 students have completed our modules with a rate of over 90%. This is just an example of how student affairs served students and the university this past year. Our priorities for this academic year are to continue to grow our philanthropic funds and increase scholarships, specifically to recognize the talents within our African American and DACA communities. We will follow science and data to provide students with information about COVID to ensure their health and safety as we re-enter in-person services. We continue our work to move the needle in GI 2025 and close the opportunity gap. 
we will engage our campus and stakeholders in important conversations about enrollment services distinct from enrollment management. And of course, we want to continue to increase our academic partnerships. But the most important work student affairs will do this year and as long as it takes is that of improving the racial climate on campus to remove systemic barriers of racism and to raise a consciousness of our students, staff and faculty through our programs, resources, time and love. As a first generation college student, I feel our students anxieties around identity and social adequacy. I hear stories year after year that sound similar to my own. As an undergraduate and as a graduate student, I experience both sides of what I refer to as the life curve of events that enhance and elevate or that distract and deplete you. I recall learning about slavery and racism, the genocide of native and first peoples, and the history of immigration in the United States from Dr. Blaine Harding in my ethnic studies courses. I saw for the first time my experience reflected in the eyes of a person of color. He brought a deeper significance to my identity and to understanding. I recall my faculty advisor, Dr. Werner Wilson, white man from Georgia, who funded my research out of private funds because I wasn't documented, all the while protecting my status. In the same memory mix, I recall professors who anglicized my first name without hesitation, questioned if I was in the right class in a physics course. And one characterized my choice of clothing with a comment of, oh, your people must like bright colors. Subtle and yet significant in their effect, their words stung in the moment and elicited a reluctance to engage with faculty, made me question my academic fitness to attend the university and whether I belonged. And now those microaggressions inform my work at Cal State Fullerton, along with the memories of what Dr. Harding and Dr. Werner Wilson and every professor who dug a little deeper to understand the nuances of diversity and inclusion and made me feel like I belonged. As faculty, you have the opportunity to inspire to awaken critical inquiry, to make a student feel that they do belong at Cal State Fullerton. This influence is profound when optimized and problematic when ignored. I am leading our division this year as a grand opportunity for student affairs into a more complete relationship with the university while honoring the many aspects of ethnic, generational, and social diversity our students bring to campus. Student affairs will always look to the best interest of students. Each one, everyone. Thank you. Now is the time for the main event. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce the next convocation speaker, President Fran Burgi. Although in the Senate, he has another title, and that is Senator Burgi, which is indicative of how much of an active partner in shared governance he has been. I was Senate chair when he was first named as our interim president, and I'm happy to be back in this role to work with him now. I think it's safe to say that from the moment Fram and Julie walked on campus or drove on campus in that really cool classic Titan blue truck, it was clear that they both had blue and orange running through their veins. I've never seen a president who is at more campus events, whether it's in the community, at our performing arts events, at our athletic competitions, at club events, and so many more Fram and Julie are there to lend support to our programs and I think just to enjoy the campus experience. I'll always remember joining them for an early season baseball game a few years ago in what seemed like 30 degree weather. And then later joining Fram on the faculty staff basketball team that played a student team at halftime of one of our games. I also remember the detailed conversations we've had on serious issues of policy, budgets, and how to best promote the incredible work of our faculty students and staff. This year is an important year for a lot of reasons. We know we have challenges to face with the pandemic, with the budget, and in helping to make our society a better place. It's also an important year because we now have a full team in it for the long run with a new permanent provost and a new permanent VP of student affairs. We know that this year is gonna be very active with the entire team and with all the faculty, staff, students, and administrators working to make this place work. As much as I miss the campus environment and the camaraderie of the Senate, I'm excited to get started on the work ahead of us and excited to hear from the president about the state of the university. 
It is my honor and privilege to welcome and introduce President Fran Burgi. Good morning or afternoon or whatever time it is and whatever day it is. I've taken to calling this uh, Blur's Day and I know I'm not alone. I saw a tweet the other day that captured how so many of us feel. It read something like, this is not the first day of September, it's the 144th day of March. My before and after photos might paint an even more vivid picture. So take a look at this. This was me on March 1st. And this was me this morning. Look, the point is, it has indeed been a blur ever since 140 some days ago when on a dime, we move people, move resources, and move mountains to transition to virtual teaching, learning, and working. It has not only been tiring, it's been difficult. It has been heartbreaking. It has tested our patience, our fortitude, and our resolve. Some of us and some of our mem family members have lost jobs. Some had to pick up second or third jobs. Some lost family members. Some lost their health, and tragically, others lost their lives. And that was only the heartache caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The true plague, the systemic racism that for too long has infected our nation, our state, and yes, even our university, has not surprisingly bubbled up and caused even more pain, much more pain, broken even more hearts, and landed us where we find ourselves today. So where are we? Well, for starters, as I said in my welcome back letter, we are at the place where it would be disingenuous for me to look at you all in your collective Zoom eye and say, hey, welcome back. Hope you had a bitch in summer. We're, and we're all relaxed and restful. I know that's not what, what's happening. I know our faculty and staff worked long and hard throughout this summer to ensure all our teaching and support services are transformational and engaging, as engaging as they can possibly be. I know our students spent the summer navigating the dangers of leaving their house to work multiple jobs while continuing their academic preparation. And I know we all did this while caring for and worrying about our loved ones, caring about our family. So where does that leave us at the beginning of this new academic year? Well, when it comes to the pandemic, that's a difficult question to answer because it changes minute to minute and hour by hour. But when it comes to where we are and where we must stand in regards to institutional racism, that could not be more clear. Titan family, this is our generation's 1964, 56 years later. And make no mistake, when we look back at this academic year, whether it's six years or 56 years from now, nobody will be able to say Cal State Fullerton missed this opportunity. There will be no doubt about where we stood. There will be no doubt about how we created ripples of hope until they became tides of change. There will be no doubt about which university stirred up the good trouble until it was no longer seen as trouble, only good. But before we can make that history, we must first confront our past. Not just our nation's history, but our beloved institution's history as well. Yes, we have always endeavored to be a beacon for social justice, equity, and inclusion. And in so many ways, we have succeeded mightily, but not always. We are no different than our state and our nation on that front. And that means we must get better. We must stand taller. And as I have been saying since George Floyd's murder, each of us must allow our hearts to break for all the hearts that we as a nation and a people have broken. Only then can the healing come. Only then can we begin to be the change that we seek. You know, my friend Ivan Pitts, who's the pastor of Second Baptist Church in Santa Ana and a Titan faculty member, has a much better way of putting that sentiment with a story he tells. And because I can't do his words justice, I thought I would just share a clip of him telling that story. I was in a dorm room with a young African 
a student from the Cameroon. His name was Jacob. And Jacob was a stately young man, always walked with his chest out, his head up, a smile on his face, and he spoke with authority from on high. And we would always see each other in the hallways because we shared the same uh, dorm um, floor. And every time I see him being a guy from California, shorts and a T-shirt and kind of a bit um, rough around the edges, if you will. Some may argue that I still am. And I would always say to Jacob, hey, Jacob, what's up, man? And he would always respond, I'm OK if you're OK. And I would always think that's the weirdest response. The weirdest response. I'm OK if you're OK. After a few weeks, I, I asked him the same thing and he would always say that. I said, but why do you always say I'm OK if you're OK? You're in America now. You got to just say, what's up, man, back. He goes, oh, no, I could never just say, what's up, man, back. He says, my culture, I can't be OK if you're not OK. So I say, I'm OK if you're OK. It's the concept of Mbutu, which is a collective community of humanity coming together. And it says that it's not I, it's not me, but it's we. It's we. I'm OK only if you're OK. Colleagues and friends, there are too many among us, faculty, staff, and students, who are just not okay. They are not okay with seeing people who look just like them shot in the back. They are not okay with the inequitable access to healthcare, education, property, safety, and upward mobility. They are not okay with being both invisible and hypervisible everywhere from our classrooms to the boardrooms. And to paraphrase LA Clipper coach Doc Rivers, they are not okay continuing to love a country that does not seem to love them back. Titan family, these are our friends and colleagues. These are our students and alumni. These are our brothers and sisters and sons and daughters. These are our folk and they are not okay. They are telling us that they are not okay. And until they are okay, I cannot be okay. You cannot be okay. And this institution and our community as a whole just cannot be okay. So how do we create that beloved community we are, where we are all loved, where we are all okay? As many of you know, over the past two years, we have been redoubling our commitment to do exactly that with our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. But if we are to continue to get better and stand taller as the change agent that we seek to be, then diversity, equity, and inclusion must be the lens through which we critique ourselves and be honest about our past, focus intently upon the present, and envision and dream of our future. With that in mind, that is where I will begin as I both highlight the year that was and frame the year that will be. First and foremost, in a cross-campus collaboration, our Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity programs created Titans Together, Striving for Justice, Equity, and Inclusion. Now that's a mouthful, what is it? It's a multi-year, anti-racism, anti-bias, presidential initiative that includes our campus's first common read, The Book of Unknown Americans by Christina Enriquez. And I certainly hope that you have your copy by now and you're going to be joining us in reading. Titans Together is also a comprehensive longitudinal commitment to attacking systemic racism, rooting out discrimination, eviscerating white privilege, and building a beloved community. And it is and can be so much more, but only if all of us engage with it daily and build its themes into everything that we do. Other DEI efforts this past year that have occurred under the Titans Together moniker include anti-racism training, diversity and equity and inclusion frameworks for all six divisions. We also launched a year-long program from the College of Education that offers faculty eight online modules focused on teaching through the lens of culturally relevant pedagogy. And this summer, we developed various programs and virtually community spaces to share and heal from anti-Black racism and violence around our nation. 
I also began a personal concerted effort to see our social justice endeavors transcend our campus and local circle of influence. To that end, I began working with CORE, Christ Our Redeemer First AME Church, the largest black church in Orange County, to hold a series of town halls and panels on issues related to social justice and racism. We've had three town hall panels so far, and we have three more scheduled, and I invite you to join us on those panels and for those discussions. I also convened social justice working groups with both our local community college leaders and a cohort of university presidents and chancellors from across the country. The latter led to the video created and produced here at Cal State Fullerton that launched last week. And in case anyone missed it, I'm proud to share that video with you here and now. We, the presidents and chancellors of public higher education institutions from across the nation, stand together to call out and eradicate discrimination and racism. We stand together as leaders of vastly different universities, some large and in the heart of densely populated urban areas, others small and in the isolation of America's farmland. Some historically black colleges and universities other Hispanic and Native American serving institutions. Some incredibly diverse and multicultural and others more racially and ethnically homogenous. We stand together intending to leverage the full weight of our positions and power to root out anti-black policies and procedures. We stand together to provide equitable pathways to higher education in which diversity and inclusion is not only celebrated but integral to the success of every student in every discipline. We stand together, declining the antiquated calls to lead institutions that are merely not racist. Instead, we aim to be anti-racist and enhance our support of underrepresented faculty, staff, and students. For those of us born with privilege, we stand together to correct the inequities that benefit us at the expense of others. We stand together for those who have been mistreated, falsely imprisoned, or have died at the hands or under the gavel of injustice. We stand together with all of you, the more than 100,000 students we collectively represent. For you are our future. And as we unite at this historic confluence of promise and hope, we vow to listen to learn from and collaborate with you to eradicate the injustice that is wrapped in our nation's history and too often perpetuated today. We stand together in recognition of the unique gifts each of our respective institutions bring to this work. Some have bold ideas and radical abilities. Others are more subtle and measured in their approach. But all are bound by their unrestrained mission of building a world of love and acceptance through education. And finally, we stand together to ensure our students, faculty, and staff understand that they are not only invited, but expected to join us in this commitment. Only then can we stir the good trouble until it is no longer seen as trouble, only good. Only then can we turn ripples of hope into tides of change. Only then can we reach our dream of a beloved community. Only then will we truly be one. By coming together, by, by working together, together, by standing together, together we stand together. I want you to know that each president and each chancellor are showing that same video and making that same statement at their convocations. At the landing page for that video, there's a place where all of us can join in this pledge, and I encourage you to do just that. And it does not end with the video. We are following up with a DEI framework that each leader will be implementing at our respective institutions, and we aim to bring in more universities to further spread this movement. So I am proud that all of this and so much more has led to Cal State Fullerton being the recipient of the insight into Diversity's Higher Education Excellence in Diversity Award for a record second year in a row. 
But as you all know, we don't do this for the awards. We do it for our faculty, staff, and students. And that is the lens through which I will share just some of the fruit born from this work. For starters, we now have the most diverse faculty and staff in our history, with particularly impressive gains in recruiting Latinx tenure track faculty. This slide will give you an idea of how far we've come over the past eight years. As you can see on the left, in the fall of 2012, our tenure track faculty was 68% white, 20% Asian, 8% Latinx, 3% Black, and just 43% women. And as you can see in the middle, the diversity of our new cohort hired this year for tenure track faculty is 32% white, 32% Asian, 27% Latinx, 5.4% Black, and 62% female. And finally, as you can see in the column on the right, that brings the diversity of our tenured and tenure track faculty university wide to 11.3% Latinx, which is a 41% increase over the past eight years, to 3.8% Black, which is a 27% increase, to 25% Asian, which is also a 25% increase, and to 49% female, which is a 14% increase over the last eight years. We also now have the greatest staff diversity in history. And if you look at this slide, you will see that Cal State Fullerton now has a higher percentage of traditionally unrepresented non-instructional staff than the system-wide average, including Latinx, Asian, Black, Native American, and Hawaiian. Now I wanna pause here and make one thing very clear. As proud as we are of these improvements, and we are proud of them, we are nowhere done, nowhere near done, and our commitment to recruiting and retaining high quality and diverse faculty and staff is going to remain unwavering. And I invite you to go to the Titans Together website and review the HRDI framework to see all the ways we are working to do just that. How do these and other such achievements in diversifying our faculty and staff translate into student success? Well, for starters, in 2020, more Latinx students earned their Titan degree than in any other year in our history. More Latinx women earned a Titan degree than in any other year. More underrepresented students earned a Titan degree than in any other year. More underrepresented women earned their master's degree at Cal State Fullerton than in any other year in our history. The equity gap for first-time freshman students improved by nearly 70%, dropping from 5.5% to a record low of 1.5%. First-year retention rates for Black students increased from 85% to 89%, with a 35% improvement in four-year graduation rates. Four-year graduation rates for Black women went from 26% to 40% over the past year alone which is a remarkable 54% improvement year over year, and the highest such rates in our 62 year history. And of course, we were once again ranked number one in California for conferring bachelor's degree to Latinx students, and number two in the nation for graduating underrepresented students. And for anyone saying that this success is by accident and not design, I have a few colleagues who would like to discuss that with you. Colleagues who have committed their lives and their careers to programs like MSI Fullerton, Santa Ana Promise, Santa Ana Ad Adelente, Gear Up, Latino Communications Initiative, Kids to College, Upward Bound, Tuffy's Graduation Scholars, HSI STEM Articulation, Abrego Future Scholars, I Am First, Titan Dreamers Resource Center, Aldea, the Center for Research on Educational Access and Leadership, and so many other programs. Again, this is not to say that we do not have more work to do. And as you will soon hear, that work has already begun. But it is to say, I can assure you that none of this, none of this is by accident. It is by intent. But first, I want to now dive into our progress toward Graduation Initiative 2025 and our goals over the past academic year. Our four-year graduation rates for first-time freshmen went from 29% to over 32% from 2019 to 
which is an 11% improvement and the highest such rates in our institution's history. Our six-year graduation rates for first-time freshmen remained right around 69%, an all-time high set last year that puts us on a trajectory that is only 6% percentage points away from our GI 2025 goal of 75%. Both two and four year graduation rates for transfer students improved to record highs and we are now nipping at the heels of our GI 2025 goal five years early in that category as well. Maybe the best way to continue tooting our Titan horn is by sharing a portion of what I wrote to Chancellor White at the beginning of my review document this year. Yeah, that's right. I too have to do a review every year. For some context, the document response asks me, as it does every year, to quote, compare the current year to the previous year on select key outcomes, unquote, quote. But as I wrote to Chancellor White, when I was thinking about those key outcomes over the past year, such as our successful 10-year WASC accreditation, our highest GPA and graduation rates ever, and the hiring of 37 tenure track faculty that helped raise our tenure density to nearly 55% and shrink the density gap between us and the system to less than 1%. When it comes to these and other massive Titan achievements, I don't think about the measurements that are asked about in my review. Instead, I think of the people, the people who made them so. I think of the student I met as the pandemic hit who was doubling her hours working at Walmart after both her parents were laid off so she could support her family while continuing her path to a Titan degree. I think of our diversity in initiatives and resource center or DERC and our faculty development center, the FDC, collaborating to create building community, compassion and resilience in turbulent times. And all the Titans who stood with our black student union to heal and create a more inclusive campus. I think of our HRDI professionals who worked around the clock to provide counseling, even as they themselves were grieving at the beginning of last, semester, last year after the loss of a fellow Titan on campus grounds. I think of the email I received from a student just a few weeks ago that said, due to the pandemic, I lost my job and lost my housing. However, Professor Susan Shimazu in our Asian American Studies Department immediately helped me secure temporary housing and checked in on me every couple of days, even on Sundays. Professor Shimazu has made my experience as a first-generation college student the best I could ask for. I love my CSU family. So yes, in lieu of measurements and numbers, I think of these Titan faculty, staff, and student heroes. Just as I think of all of you who have been equally heroic over this past year. And when I think about you, I do what I do best. I brag about you. So with your indulgence, I will now do what I did in my review. Since Provost Thomas focused on the colleges with a few of their tremendous highlights and faculty stories, I will focus on select achievements from each of our divisions. Let's start with academic affairs. In academic affairs, the hiring of Provost Thomas was not our only achievement over the past year, although it was a big one and I'm really pleased to welcome her to the Titan family. I should say welcome her back to the Titan family. This past summer, the Faculty Development Center delivered 31 multiple day sessions of the new faculty designed teaching remotely course to over 1100 faculty registrants. And that brings the number of faculty who participated in professional development this summer to nearly 3,500. That is an astounding number. Further, we tripled the number of faculty who have completed our three-week quality assurance course offerings through the CSU Academic Technologies Project since the program began in 2012. Tripled it in one summer. The Academic Advisement Center team also busy this summer, virtually supported a record number of over 5,400 first-time freshmen enrolling for the fall semester and completing all virtual general education training modules. On top of that, 92.2% of the first-time freshmen 
were registered as full-time students and half are carrying 15 units so that they can finish in four. Our student headcount exceeds last year's by 1,300 students and over 190 course selections were added to accommodate that higher student population. And finally, the Office of Research and Sponsored Projects secured a record high $31.5 million in grants and contracts. And all of that is on top of leading our academic efforts to turn on a dime from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual learning, and then to plan for fall and bring us to this point. Academic affairs has had an astounding year. And then there are student affairs. Vice President Osagira stole some of the student affairs thunder, and rightfully so, but there is one area she left to me, Titan Athletics. I should first point out that our student athletes recorded the highest cumulative GPA in our history with an awesome 3.32 GPA. And our all athletic academic progress rate or APR was a record 979 out of 1,000. And for the teams that actually had the opportunity to play out their season, they were just as good on the field as they were in the classroom. Women's soccer and women's cross country both brought home Big West championships. I was and am still deeply saddened for the student athletes whose seasons were cut short, as just as I am for Titans during this difficult time in our music program, in our theater program, our choral groups, our intramural and club sports, our students in our capstone engineering programs, business programs, NSM projects, all our students. But mixed up in that sorrow, Baked into that sadness, there is an incredible and indelible sense of pride. For athletics, it is a pride in who each of them are. Player, coach, trainer, manager, administrator. And a pride in who all of you are, the fans and supporters who cheer them on with an F on your chest and Titan blue orange in your veins. Our triumphant return will come and when it does, Jules and I will be right there with you in the front row, front and center, at all our games, at the revealing of those capstone projects, at our ASI meetings, in our Centers for Scholars and Dirk and Honors, in the drama and music programs, in the newly renovated South Tower of the Library, and on and on. Like all of you, I miss so much being on campus. I can't wait to be back, to see you, and be with you. I already spoke a great deal about the amazing year HRDI had in their efforts to both continue diversifying our faculty and staff while providing welcoming, inclusive environments for us all. I will say, like every other division in college, they too pivoted on a dime back in March, quickly shifting many programs to virtual modalities, including major events like Titan Family Engagement Day, the, the What Brings Us Together lunch and the University Awards. Not to be outdone, our Division of Information Technology excelled in their usual partnerships, such as the one with Academic and Student Affairs to grow access to high impact practices. From 15,000 students participating in 591 sections last year to more than 17,000 students participating in more than 880 courses this year. And they work their magic in so many other ways, as they always do. But when we transition to virtual modalities, that is when the IT divisions shine brighter than ever before by filling much of a very real digital divide by providing thousands of laptops and MiFi's and hotspots and iPads and all other kinds of technology support to help us all adapt to the new normal. The Division of Administration and Finance capped off an incredible year with the unanimous Board of Trustees approval of our new student housing facility and our first physical master plan in almost 15 years. They also led our continued refurbishing of the library and the completion of our east side parking structure, which added 1,900 parking spaces with energy efficient lighting and a solar canopy. Staff members from this division worked all summer to exceed all national guidelines on disinfecting the campus and installing safety protocols to keep returning Titans safe. 
And we cannot talk about the excellence of this division without talking about our university police department. Just over a year ago, at the beginning of that semester, many of us watched from our office windows as these men and women ran toward danger. They didn't know the extent of that danger or how it, it would manifest itself. But while the rest of us sought safety, they put their lives on the line to ensure we had the safety we sought. Our men and women and, and dog of the UPD are prepared to do that every single day. On an average, 20,000 annual calls with, with less than an approximately 0.05% for use of force incidents. And as Chief Aguirre wrote to all of us just a few weeks ago, with the support of the faculty and staff and students on the Chief's Advisory Board and the entire community, UPD is committed. Committed to bolstering an already impressive regime of programs to ensure UPD outreach and policing is always conducted through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Committed to listening and learning and working with us and leading from the center of our community. And finally, before I move on from talking about administration and finance, I should address the budget. I first wanna thank past chair Dave Mickey and the Planning Resource and Budget Committee, or PRBC, for presenting me with an insightful and pragmatic budget set of recommendations. Vice President Kim and I are currently working to respond to those recommendations in ways that we hope will put the institution's best foot forward despite the financial hit brought on by the pandemic. And I will present that response at a PRBC meeting later this month. And as always, this entire process will be transparent and will be on the PRBC website. Today, however, I can speak on a few things regarding our 2021 budget. First, our share of the final $299 million system-wide baseline budget cut stands at $24 million for our campus. This is on top of the 35 million in losses we've experienced to date in our self-funded enterprises like parking and housing, and our more than $4 million in unexpected COVID-related expenditures much of which is tied to IT in our move to virtual teaching and learning. As I wrote to the campus this summer, despite the unprecedented nature of COVID-19, we were not caught entirely off guard or unprepared. Over the past two budget cycles, we have worked very hard to reduce the structural budget deficit and to establish some limited reserves that empower us to both help cover our losses and live up to our educational commitments. As we began to prepare for COVID-19 back in January, the belt tightening measures we implemented, including our ongoing hiring chill and travel freeze, gave us just a little more breathing room. All of this in conjunction with the significant resources, $40 million, that we received and dispersed from the CARES Act, this has all been crucial for these past few months. That said, we have already faced the unfortunate reality of layoffs, either for lack of work or lack of funds or both. We hope to minimize any further layoffs this academic year through more belt tightening and drawing down on our reserves. And we do not plan for any furlough program this fiscal year, although it's quite possible we might need it next year. With all of you, we will continue to strive to mitigate the impact this budget crisis has on our Titan family and the quality of the education we provide. And of course, in making budgetary decisions, we will be in consultation with all relevant stakeholders, including our union representatives, the Academic Senate, Senate Exec, PRBC, ASI, and all other stakeholders. One way to offset this budget cut is to continue to enhance our philanthropic endeavors, which brings us to the university advancement. Together with all of you, UA managed to successfully launch our campus first comprehensive philanthropic campaign. And we are now 78% to our $200 million goal after recording the highest fundraising year in our history with total philanthropic gift commitments exceeding $37 million, literally shattering last year's record of $28 million. 
Last, this year, we met or exceeded all of our donor total goals, including parents, alumni, individuals, class gifts, faculty and staff gifts. And we also grew the number of major gifts and foundation proposals and had the highest number of planned gifts in our history. It was also our highest cash year in history, and we received the single largest cash gift ever recorded. And contrary to many philanthropic campaigns, in the face of this pandemic, we did not lose momentum. Instead, between March 15th and May 31st, during the heart of the pandemic, we received more than 4.2 million in philanthropic commitments. And that's a 14% increase over the same time period for last year. With university advancement and our College of Business and Economics in the lead, we have received much support for our handling of our separation from former donor, Stephen Mahalo. As unfortunate and unwelcome as that situation was, it does open doors for new opportunities and I am confident our engagement with the community and alumni will more than fill the void left by Mr. Mahalo's unkept promises. As we move ahead in this academic year, all of us will continue to teach, work, and learn under significant stress. And the only way our collaborative energy will bear fruit is if we treat each other with the compassion and empathy we both deserve and need. As Jules reminds me almost daily, we need and deserve some grace during these difficult times. And that is the first of three overarching objectives I want to place before you for this upcoming year. Be kind, be patient, understanding, and empathetic. If we do that while remaining focused on our second objective, which is to faithfully keep all our work tied to our five-year strategic plan, I am confident we will reach and exceed each of the four commitments in that plan. Our commitment to transformational Titan experiences for our students. This includes the need to replicate and enhance what our College of Education is doing with their modules on culturally relevant pedagogy so we can increase inclusivity in the, in the teaching and learning we provide our students. Our commitment to student success and completion. This includes our unwavering focus on GI 2025 and eliminating equity gaps. Our commitment to faculty and staff diversity. This includes the need for all of us to seek out professional development, training, and community connections to make our offices, classrooms, and yes, our Zoom windows more welcoming and inclusive and our commitment to our learning environment and legacy. I know, I know, I said three objectives and then slipped in four commitments on top of those objectives, but what can I say? I'm a lawyer. And the third and final objective for this academic year brings me back to where I started, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Be inclusive. Be vigilant in your efforts to both root out systemic racism and stand with those affected by it. Be proactive in seeking out anti-bias and anti-racist training opportunities. Log on to our Titans Together website and get involved in the work. Join us in the common read. If you are like me, born with unearned privilege, be tenacious in exhausting it, in giving it away to humanity, to equity, to inclusion and justice for all. Titan family, if we can do all of that together, years from now, we won't look back at this academic year and think about it as heartache and strife. Instead, we will look back and say, that was the year that changed everything. The year that we changed everything. That was the year we truly became the beacon for equity and inclusion that we always sought to be. And that was the year that both individually and collectively, we knew our institution would never be okay until every single Titan is okay. But before we can look at our past and say that was the year, we have to look at the present and say, now is the time. Now is the time, Titan family. And while I do believe it takes a Titan, I also know that all of you, each of you, are the Titans that it takes. Now is that time. So let us get to it. Thank you. Be safe. 
stay well, stay healthy, happy new academic year, and thank you. Go Titans, go.